In this video, we're going to look at two more variations of diffuse light, point lighting and spot lighting. Unlike my last video, which was a bit more of a deep dive, I'm really going to try and keep this video as short and focused as possible. Here's what our point light code will look like. This is basically the same as with directional diffuse lighting, except now we have an attenuation factor, which reduces the brightness of a surface as the light gets farther away. And here's the spotlight code. In this case, it takes the point light concept and adds a restriction. Now the light only has an effect inside a cone, which we describe with three new variables. The direction the spotlight is pointed, and two angles. One is for where the point light starts to fade, and the other is for where the light has completely finished fading. And we use the GLSL function smooth step to smoothly transition from the fully lit area to the fully unlit area, rather than having a sharp boundary. Both of these depend on the same diffuse calculation code that we explored in the last lighting video. If all of what I'm about to say doesn't make complete sense to you, I recommend that you go back and watch that previous video. However, in case you don't watch that video, this brightness calculation gives us a single number between 0 and 1, where 0 represents unlit and 1 represents fully lit. We calculate this number using the dot product of two vectors. The direction the surface is pointed, called the normal, and the direction from the surface to the light. Since this can produce negative numbers and negative brightness isn't a thing, we cut it off at 0. And last, for all of this to work, we have to use unit vectors, vectors with a length of exactly 1. So, sometimes we have to normalize them. The reason I'm going over all this again is because this same diffuse calculation is at the core of both point and spot lighting. No matter where it is in a 3D world, if a surface is turned away from a light, it will be dark. When it's turned toward a light, even slightly, it will be brighter, and when it's pointed directly at the light, it will be at its brightest. And that's still happening here. What's changed is that now our light is at a specific 3D location, where before, with directional light, the light source is considered so far away compared to the scale of our scene that both the intensity of the light and the direction to the light are considered constant. For point lighting, all this changes. First, the direction will depend on where the surface is in relation to the light, but second, the intensity of that light will change depending on the distance between the surface and the light. This second effect is called attenuation, and it's the critical feature of point lighting. Okay, so now we're going to have to keep track of these two new variables for point lighting, direction and distance. So let's look at how we do that. WebGL shader language, GLSL, has its own function just for calculating the distance between two points, and we absolutely could use that here, but we won't. Instead, I'm going to recommend that we do this in two steps. You'll see why in a second. First, we calculate the 3D offset between these two points, basically the vector that points from our surface point to the light source. It's just a simple calculation. It's the light vec3 minus the surface point vec3. Next, to calculate the distance, we just measure the length of this vector. We'll use GLSL's length function for this. So, we have a distance value, so we're ready to calculate attenuation, which we'll do in a second. But first, let's figure out the direction to the light source. Except we already have that, right? Our offset was calculated as the vector from the surface position to the light, so it's definitely pointed in the right direction. Only we need a unit vector. Its length has to be exactly 1. So we just normalize it. So we have our distance, and now we have our direction. There are several ways that we can calculate attenuation, but they're all a variation of this, the inverse square law. You probably learned this in high school physics for maybe magnetism or gravity, but it also works for light. And it says that for a point light source, the intensity at a distance d is 1 over d squared. 
This is the simplest attenuation equation, and maybe it's all you really need. And the code to do that looks like this. But a couple of problems. Let's go to a graphing calculator to see what they are. The vertical scale here is our brightness value i, and the horizontal scale is d, our distance. First, notice that when d is very small, the brightness gets extremely large. In fact, at zero, where our light source is touching our surface, the intensity is infinite. This isn't always a problem. If you're completely certain that your point light won't get too near your geometry, the inverse square is fine. If you can't be sure of that, then maybe it's a bad choice. And the other problem is that the brightness falls to almost zero very quickly. This is not necessarily unrealistic, in fact it's kind of the opposite. It's just that sometimes we want a point light source to have more of an effect for longer. So it's really a matter of opinion. Because of this, here is probably the most common attenuation function that you'll come across. In fact, this used to be built in to OpenGL for lighting calculations, though it was never part of WebGL. It's usually called the constant linear quadratic function. We still have our inverse square in there, it's uh, the quadratic part, it's scaled by a factor a, and there's a new linear component, scaled by a factor b. And there's a new constant component, c. c ensures that the brightness doesn't go off to infinity when the distance is zero, and finding a good combination of a and b can make the fall off in brightness as gentle or as sharp as you want. A quick tip, if your code is done and you're just fine-tuning these values, use a graphing calculator. Plugging in random values is just disorienting, and usually ends up wasting time. I've linked to this graphing calculator in the description, but find one that you like and always use it. Anyway, here's what this quadratic linear constant attenuation function looks like in GLSL. And here's the last attenuation function I'll show you. This is a mathematical approximation, not of a point light, but of a disk of light, a, a light with a radius, r. It's not as flexible as the constant linear quadratic function, but a lot of people insist that this is the most physically realistic and satisfying attenuation function of the three. Here's what that function looks like in GLSL. I recommend that you try out all three and experiment with the differences. Anyway, once we've chosen our attenuation function, it's time to bring everything together. And we do that by just using our new direction variable in our diffuse brightness calculation, and multiply the result by our attenuation value. So our final GLSL code for point lighting looks like this. For the previous two lighting systems, there was always a central concept that was key to implementing it. For directional diffuse light, it was using the dot product to calculate the cosine for the cosine emission law. For point light, it was attenuation. And for spotlighting, it's something called smooth step. It's just an equation that describes a curve. And this is what that curve looks like. All we're doing here is finding how much of value is between two numbers, clamping that proportion between 0 and 1, and then applying an exponential expression that smooths out the edges. If you've done any traditional computer animation before, you might recognize that this is just a tween. But this exact curve is the one that you'll see most often with point lights. Now, you have two options here. You could implement this tween using math. If you did, here's what your code would look like. And a lot of tutorials and sample spotlighting code that you'll find online does exactly this. Or you can use the smooth step function that's built into GLSL, and your code looks like something like this. Totally your choice. But according to the OpenGL documentation, mathematically, they are the same. For this video, I'll be using the built-in function, but you're free to do this however you want, or even use your own custom tween function. Anyways, now let's talk about how to actually implement spotlighting. You can think of a spotlight as a simplified point light that has an area of effect that's shaped like a cone. Fragments inside this cone are lit, fragments outside it are not. Whether a fragment is lit depends on two things. 
First, obviously, the angle that the light is pointed. If the light is pointed right at the fragment, of course it's illuminated. And second, it depends on the angular size of the cone. If the light is pointed slightly off to the side, but the cone is still wide enough, it's still illuminated. And in all other cases, it's not illuminated at all. Now, the way I've described things here, a fragment is either lit or it's dark, nothing in between. But usually we want our spotlights to have a soft border that transitions smoothly from completely lit to completely unlit. And the easiest way to do this is to use two cones. If a fragment is outside the outer cone, it's dark. If it's inside the inner cone, it's lit. And if it's somewhere in between, it's partially lit. A totally simple idea. But how do we tell when a fragment is in or out of these two cones? First, we need to know where the light is pointed. This will come into our programs usually as a uniform VEC3. Next, we'll need the angular size of the two cones. You could send these in as angles, as in degrees or radians, but as you'll see, it makes much more sense to calculate your angles once as cosine values in your JavaScript, and send in those values instead. So, you'll send in three uniforms, a VEC3 light direction, and two floats for our cosine cone angles. Next, we calculate the direction from the light to the fragment. And we just learned how to do that. We, we could subtract the fragment position from the light position, that's sort of the opposite of what we did before, and then normalize the result. But since we already calculated the direction from the fragment to the light for the diffuse brightness calculation, we can just take the negative of that. It's the same thing. So now we have two directions. We have the direction the light is pointed, and we have the direction from the light to the fragment. Now, do you remember what we get if we calculate the dot product of two unit vectors? It gives us the cosine of the angle between them. That's, that's the whole reason that we use dot products in our diffuse brightness calculations, right? Well, if we got the dot product of our two directions here, that would give us the cosine of the angle between the way the light is pointed and the direction to the fragment, and that gives us a third cosine value. We already had one for the inner cone, and we had one for the outer cone, and now we have the angle to the fragment, and that's everything we need to call smooth step. The result is our spotlighting brightness factor, and we just need to multiply that with our diffuse value to get our final brightness. And our code looks like this. Are we done? Well, that depends. Let me ask you an important question. Does a spotlight attenuate? D does a spotlight get weaker with distance? See, our spotlight code here, and most of the spotlight code examples you find online, assume that the brightness at one meter is the same as the brightness at a thousand meters. And sometimes that's completely fine. Spotlights are great for focusing attention, and light falloff sometimes kills that effect. So maybe attenuation isn't necessary for you. But if it is important, the final calculation will probably look something like this. Our total brightness is the product of our diffuse lighting, and our spotlight calculation, and our attenuation. This is an artistic choice, and which way you go is totally up to you. So that's probably it for diffuse lighting. I hope this all made sense. See you next time.